Hello and a very warm welcome to the Cogit podcast series. My name is Anthony Richards and I'm the editorial director of Cogit. Um, today I'm delighted to be joined by Dr. Catherine Brown, who is reader in religion and global security at Birmingham University. She is the author of Gender, Religion, Extremism, Finding Women in Anti-Radicalization, published with Oxford University Press in 2020. And she co-leads the project Humanities for Resilience that looks at how the humanities and civil society, faith groups and academia can and do contribute to the resilience of marginalized communities. Policy work that Dr. Brown has carried out includes work such as gender mainstreaming principles, dimensions and priorities in PVE with UN Women in 2019, and gender specific approaches to exit work for the Radicalization Awareness Network, also in 2019. Catherine, a warm welcome, and thank you so much for joining me today. My pleasure. Excellent. So um, my first question, really, I, I guess is um, perhaps a partly conceptual one. Um, in the chapter that you kindly contributed to our edited volume, um, you noted that there are two categories of response to violent extremism, um, one being CVE and one being PVE, countering violent extremism and preventing violent extremism. I wonder if you could outline what you see as the difference between the two and what the remits of each are. Absolutely. So I think one of the first things we can do is think about, well, why have these terms come into fruition? Like, why, why do we see them in policy and in practice, as opposed to simply countering terrorism? And in a way, both of them reflect the expanding understanding of security threats away from simply what people might do to including their perceptions of who they are and how they interact in the world. So PV and CV are part of that broadening remit. Um, so that policymakers, practitioners and civil society can begin to engage perhaps at an earlier stage um, in, yeah, in intervening in people's lives or in communities in order to prevent security or to counter security threats such as terrorism. So the conflation and the complications come in, in part because both of these terms emerged at the same time, one in the US, one here in Europe. Um, and at the early stages they meant the same thing but what we've seen over time is an understanding that countering violent extremism occurs when violent extremism already exists within a community or within a society whereas preventing violent extremism is seen to be the work that we do to stop it from existing in the first place so if you think of a continuum of time at which point there might be terrorism or violent extremism at one end the further away you get from the act or the existence of violent extremism is where you end up in softer and softer forms of preventing violent extremism. And that's also one of the, the challenges with the language is for some people, preventing violent extremism is really a way of saying this is the soft approaches. So the non-securitized approaches to dealing with violent extremism, whereas countering violent extremism is closer to counter-terrorism. So we both have a continuum of time but also in the nature of the measures. So preventing is seen as further away and softer. That's really helpful. Thank you for that clarity. That's a really helpful distinction to make. Um, in relation to one of the key propositions in your research, um, I wonder if you could elaborate further on how an emphasis on gender has actually exposed limitations in counter radicalization strategies and policies. Absolutely. So one of the first things that we recognised when we started to look at gender, not only in terms of who is participating in violent extremism, because that's like the first level is recognising, oh, look, women do this too, but also recognising how gender influences both individuals in terms of their motivations and their actions, but also the groups in gender narratives and ideologies influence violent extremist groups in terms of how they frame their position in the world. So when we look at gender, we can also see that as part of their narrative, as part of their understanding of the world, as well as how they're organized. Now, the second thing that it does is when we started to actually recognize, oh look, women do this too, um, we noticed that both practitioners, policymakers, and academics really prioritized women's private lives. 
They talked about their marriages, their love lives, whether they'd experienced some kind of trauma in the past. Um, so, yeah. And what private networks were involved in. There was often this idea that women were pawns to men in terrorism. They were adjuncts to violent extremism. But once we started to look at women and take their agency seriously, it also called into question how we thought about men's participation. And we started to realize that yes, men like women participate in violent extremism for broadly speaking, political purposes, but they also like women participate for personal reasons. Their private lives also influence why they get involved. So once we started to look at gender, we also started to rethink some of our theories about radicalization for both men and women, as well as rethinking how we think the groups operate and why they exist and why they operate. That's fascinating. Thanks very much for that, Catherine. I mean, perhaps related to that in, in some ways, um, in the Radical Awareness Network um, ex post paper of November 2019, um, it states that research on gender and de-radicalization has found that, and I quote, even though gender is really pushed in terms of policy and CVE policy, it's not something being addressed on the ground. And also actually in the chapter that you wrote for us in our edited volume, um, and I quote, evaluations of countering radicalization programs are generally poor and woefully lacking uh, consideration of gender in their analysis. Quite a powerful statement to finish the chapter there. And, and finally, and, and I think you cite Ruth Kelly on this, um, you note that women have been identified as the missing link in UK counterterrorism since 2006. Um, I wonder if you could elaborate further on all these points, which really point us in the same direction of this lacking of the appreciation of gender in terms of counter-radicalization and counterterrorism. Yeah, so to, to the first point about or there almost being a say-do gap uh, mm. in this regard. So we can see that most organizations, whether they're research organizations, practitioner organizations, or, or policy bodies, um, governments and ministries will all tell you that they take gender seriously. And they will all say that they recognize women's participation and that they recognize how gender might influence men's activities. But it kind of stops there as these grand statements of intent but then nothing follows through, um, or very rarely do we see a follow through in action. So I can give you an example of that in Australia where they talked about recognizing domestic violence as part of terrorism and as part of violent extremism. They were in Australia, particularly uh, I think in Victoria, they were looking at how there might be a, a relationship between different types of violence. And so they said, we take women's security seriously. We're gonna treat this as part of terrorism. But when they then opened their new counterterrorism center, there was no resources for looking at gender. There were no people with expertise looking at domestic violence. There, in fact, was very little consideration of any of those broad claims about the connectivity that they had initially spoken about. So in very practical terms, it wasn't there. And unfortunately, Australia is not alone in doing this. And we can see this across Europe as well, where we see these grand statements. But to put it in very practical terms, um, another researcher, Rachel Smith, she has done quite a lot of work with practitioners in the UK and Ireland. And she talks about CVE as being a men's club, both in terms of on the ground practitioners, but also in terms of formers. So, um, people who have previously been involved in violent extremism or terrorist organizations who then come uh, into civil society to participate in preventing violent extremism work, and we call them formers. But she notes that even in that space, it's possible for men to participate as formers, to almost have a second career, if you will, um, to give back to society for, after they've taken away so much. But it's almost impossible for women to enter into that space. Um, and she then goes on to note how a lot of the activities for countering violent extremism, and this is something I've also noticed, occurs predominantly in men's spaces. So there's an assumption by counterterrorism police officers that if they want to talk to the Muslim community, they have to go to the mosque. But mosques aren't necessarily where women participate in broader society. In some mosques and some communities they do, but not always. But there's always the assumption, oh, we go to the mosque, but that just means one group of men talking to another group of men without really looking 
out where the women might be who are in fact part of a society's responses but also potentially of the violent extremist groups now the second thing that follows on from this is when um, you see in the main mostly men's clubs men's talking to each other <laughs> forgive me for saying this but sometimes you forget to realize that as men your masculinity also influences how you behave and what might be a feature so it, it reinforces this idea that gender is all about talking about women and not really looking at what kinds of masculinities what kinds of men do we want in our society what kinds of men should we be promoting and how can we go about doing that so again we might be unintentionally reinforcing perhaps some negative masculinities within our counterterrorism work without perhaps looking at say alternatives such as peaceful masculinities and that phrase peaceful masculinities has come about a lot in relation to anti-gang work in the US in South America but also in the far um, Southeast Asia as well and this idea of promoting an alternative form of masculinity but none of this gets talked about um, because the, it's kind of taken for granted that all the men are in the room. And I suppose the third part then falls on from this is where are the resources? Uh, where do the resources fall? And while women represent a minority of convictions in relation to terrorism, it's a, across Europe, it varies year on year, but between 16 and 20% of terrorism convictions are of women across Europe. So it's a, it's a minority. Um, additionally, when we look at um, prevent referrals or channel referrals, again, women remain a minority, but it's a significant minority. But then we, when we look at, okay, what resources are going into preventing women from joining violent extremist groups? There are a lot fewer, but also the structures aren't there. So if we take a look at sport, um, there's been a lot of discussion about whether sport can facilitate social cohesion whether um, sport can help combat racism, for example, right? We see that in football and rugby where players take the knee. And so there's this idea that sport has a social good. But in countering violent extremism where we can see sport being used such as cricket, football, and also boxing, all of those sports are predominantly geared towards supporting men's activities. And we don't have the resources for including that within women's sport and facilitating and encouraging women in sport and using it that way. So that's a really small example, but it follows on through in relation to that. Um, or additionally, in very practical terms, if someone has been convicted and now they're on probation or prior to convict, um, trial, they might be required to go to the police station and report in frequently. Um, so that happens a lot in France. Unfortunately, it's often the case that they have to report in at particular times that coincide when women are trying to take their kids to school. So they either are running late to the police station, in which case they get penalized, or they're running their children into school late, in which case they get penalized. Um, but these types of considerations aren't thought through because we're not really seeing women in violent extremism and terrorism. So those are some of the examples that we can go to about why still in practical terms on the, the things that people do for preventing and countering violent extremism at the everyday level, gender just seems to drop off the radar. Yeah, that's really fascinating. Thank you, Catherine. It's especially this idea that actually when you're considering gender, that includes a reflection on masculinity and, and and what the composition of that masculinity is so it's really interesting thank you for that um my next question is i, I guess in relation to uh prevent and, and particularly its change in 2011 um which you note again in in, in the chapter in the edited volume and I, and I think it's fair to say you you might disagree but I, I think it's fair to say that the focus of prevent became much wider in the sense that there was a much more explicit concern with the way people think or thought um, as well as what they do. So much more concerned with the way they think ideologically, as well as what they do, the way people think. Um, and given that your chapter actually notes uh, the perception of women having what you call backroom or supporting roles, do you think that the sort of broadening of the remit of Prevent um, actually led to therefore a greater focus on the role of women? Absolutely. 
um, it, not only the broadening of the remit prevent, but the broadening of counterterrorism legislation and our broadening of our understanding of terrorism. So in the past, um, terrorism and violent extremism is, is often almost obsessional about the act of violence itself. We're kind of the the spectacular nature of the crimes um, really takes over our understanding and our response to it. So there's often been a need to, to do something immediately after a terrorist attack or a violent extremist attack of some kind. But once you start to recognize that um, an act of terrorism doesn't happen in isolation, violent extremism doesn't just pop up from nowhere. There's a history to it, a, a timeline and ideas have to come from somewhere. And once you start to recognize that and you broaden your awareness, you realize that uh, violent extremist organizations, much like all organizations have, yeah, these background roles that, to keep them going. Um, and often women fulfill those roles, not always, but, but often the case. Um, in some cases, it's because violent extremist groups themselves really dislike the idea of carrying women participating in violence. So they actually have a, a limiting factor on women's agency. Um, in other cases, it's because they think that uh, women are more likely to evade security detection than men. Because again, we're not looking for women. So in which case women can avoid the security detection and carry on doing the background work um, without surveillance. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and the third one is uh, that it's seen that women have uh, a longevity in their participation. So they keep the, the institutional memory of an organization going over time, especially if those who have been involved in acts of violence end up in prison and can't themselves carry on with the, the activities of the group. So in that sense, absolutely, we're seeing a, a broader, broader awareness of, of women's participation, but not always with that kind of broader critical reflection about, okay, well, if we're adding women into our understanding, how then should we change our understanding of the activity and of the people um, as well? So it, it's a double-edged sword, I would say. And for women's organizations, it has also been a bit of a double-edged sword as well, because as women have been, um, women's organizations have slowly been incorporated within broader PVE work, there have come at some costs. One is this, um, in order to get funding for their activities, they have to start justifying it in terms of PVE. So rather than preventing violence against women as being a good in and of itself, and therefore getting funding, they've had to say, well, if we prevent violence against women, we also prevent violent extremism, and therefore we can get funding, right? So there's been this, this knock-on effect, and academics uh, and others, or particularly a, a professor in the US called Jane Huckabee talks about the instrumentalization of women's rights. Um, so where women's rights and their and women's organizations, their needs and their rights are seen as only valuable if they support the wider counterterrorism efforts. Yeah. Um, and that has some significant costs down the line because what if actually promoting women's rights doesn't stop terrorism? that actually violent extreme, some violent extremist groups themselves say, oh, well, no, we're actually in favor of women's rights. So if you ha start having that, then does that mean women, we should just stop working on women's rights? And as you might have gathered, given 20 odd years working in this field, I would strongly disagree with that, but we can't just rely on the assumption it will definitely improve our counterterrorism efforts if we look at the women's rights objectives. What I would say is not looking at them will undoubtedly harm them, Yeah, yeah. right? So it's a necessary but not sufficient condition for improving counterterrorism is that we take women's rights into account. Absolutely, very interesting, thank you for that. Um, my final question, um, I, I really is, is, is asking, I wonder if you could elaborate um, further on your Humanities for Resilience project, um, what its purpose is and, and perhaps what, you know, resilience means in this context. Right, so, um, I have a, a slight confession with this network. It was partly something that I, I set up. It's funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council. And my initial motivation was that I've spent, yeah, 15 odd years looking at violence. And I think it's hard on the soul. Um, and so I wanted to see the other side of the coin. And there were two kind of concrete academic motivations that 
kind of started from that. The first one was a recognition that violent extremist groups really have a very fixed image of what they think the world should be like. Um, it's a very rigid understanding of the future and a very often a very narrow remit about how much you can deviate from their, their vision. And the second thing that violent extremist groups don't like is sharing the world. They have a very uh, particular idea of who belongs. And it doesn't matter which violent extremist group you look at, their idea, they always have this hierarchy of belonging. One group of people sit at the top and they get to belong. And unless you fit that model, you don't get to share the world with them. And it occurred to me, who are the groups of people that oppose both of those things, that have really diverse visions of the future and who like sharing the world? And that seemed to be, to me, artists, musicians, comedians, um, street theater people, um, dancers. I've also come across um, food diplomacy, so people who use cooking as part of diplomatic efforts to bring communities together. Um, and also activists as well who try and raise awareness within their own communities, but often using art and crafts to do this. And so I wanted to bring together this group of people uh, who saw the world perhaps uh, in more expansive terms. And as part of their world creation through their art and their activities, we're trying to build a world that they could share. Now, this sounds very lofty and probably like the the worst kind of academia that people imagine. Um, where's the practical relevance of this? That sounds all very pie in the sky. What's this got to do with anything? Well, in very concrete and practical terms, when we see communities, especially marginalized communities, having the opportunity to imagine their stake in the world, to imagine their futures and to start creating their world alongside others, then we see a greater sense of networks, greater sense of openness, a greater willingness to participate, and it enables them to see value in their world in and of itself, so that violence doesn't become the obvious response to some of the things that they're experiencing in. And so resilience is part of that. And also the other reason for focusing on this creative side is that a lot of formal work on resilience places a significant burden on communities and often communities that are least able to take up the challenge. So we, we go to the most marginalized, the most impoverished, the most disenfranchised and say, you should be more resilient. Let's, let's, but actually they have skills, they have an understanding of the world and, it, and they have the, the strengths to build up with that. So this network is about empowering communities and and really um, art creators, I suppose, um, to see their own value and to help them recognize the contribution that they're already making and to show others how they can continue and how they, they can build resilience and make a contribution in the future as well. So yeah, it, it's been really exciting, really creative and a very, very different space and a lot of fun. Sounds like a really excellent and worthwhile project. Though. Thank you. Dr. Catherine Brown, thank you so much for joining me today and for sharing your expertise with us. Thanks again. My pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Combating Jihadist Terror. We hope you enjoyed it. If you'd like to see more episodes, they're available to watch on our website, cogit.org, or to listen to on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Thanks again.